I'll actually say Welcome that. to tomorrow. I am Carrie Ann, and I will be your Capcom <laughs> of this rowdy crew. Uh, the rest of us, I have a Sarah, a Jade, and <laughs> Athena. Now, Sarah, what do you have first for us today? <laughs> Einstein really is a genius. <laughs> and Jade? B -b Black hole in the jets. <laughs> so good. I was wondering how you were going to do that. And then on the observation deck, Miss Athena has an interview. Yes, I will be interviewing Dr. Charles Liu from the American Museum of Natural History on observational galaxy evolution. Perfect. And then this all-female crew will come back together at the end to go over your questions and comments about the last show. But this is tomorrow, Orbit 11.25. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Now, before we jump right into all of the things that we have to say, I want to make sure I give a huge thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens. These are the people who have contributed $10 per episode or more. They get free worldwide shipping in our tomorrow swag store. They get voting rights and upcoming roundtable discussions, which is really kind of funny because we should have one of those soon. Uh, <laughs> they also get access, early access to our Escape Velocity Discord channel uh, and so much more, honestly. If you are interested in becoming a citizen of tomorrow at any level, please head on over to Patreon dot com slash T M R O. Uh, you know, and I know I said just before we get into things, and now I'm going to say another just before we get into watches. <laughs> uh, you will notice we do not have a space mic. Uh, he is in the chat room though, and he says it's been a long time since I've watched live. LOL. Uh -oh. uh, yeah, I'm guessing like six, seven years or so, Mike. So, uh, but thank you for joining us in the chat room. We appreciate your presence nonetheless. So, Miss Jade, uh. <clears throat> do your best mic impression. And, oh, uh, <laughs> let, me, let me get 2D real quick. Yes, <laughs> and then uh, we had we had a, spa a, a Russia launch. I was yeah. going to say a space launch. That doesn't Russia. help anybody. <laughs> launch. So uh, what happened? Tell me more about. Um, it. Well, first of all, Mike, please uh, now exit the chat and come back in about Just, five minutes. La 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 la. Okay. Um, so yeah, Russia actually recently launched a Soyuz 21B rocket that's carrying a new replenishment satellite for its GLONASS navigation system, hmm. uh, and this is actually the 56th mission to do so. So they've had a few shots. So peaceful. And there it is. Until the sound it. hits the camera. You know, uh, <laughs> you know those Russians, they, they have very nice and silent rockets. You know, it's, it's crazy how they've been able to engineer that. You know? mm -hmm. Just kidding, that's not a thing. Um, so the GLONASS M number 56 satellite departed from the Plesetsk, there you go, Cosmodrome <laughs> at approximately 2130 UTC last Sunday, June 17th, with a Frigate M upper stage transporting the Uragan M number 756 spacecraft into orbit. Obviously. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> if you didn't know that, well, <laughs> it ejected its force drop on first stage boosters around two minutes into the mission, followed by the release of the payload about two minutes later. Cool. So you're probably wondering, GLONASS, what's GLONASS? Well, GLONASS is Russia's version of the GPS. It stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. 24 satellites comprise the GLONASS constellation. And although coverage isn't quite as strong as America's GPS, when you pair it together, both systems greatly increase accuracy in coverage. This particular satellite will actually help restore the GLONASS system back to its full strength, allowing it to provide worldwide coverage. The GLONASS-M satellite will replace an older GLONASS satellite that was deployed back in 2009, having lived out its about seven year service time, which is the average lifespan for these satellites. Um, so this new addition will actually help improve radio transmission to the satellites, uh, making it less corruptible. And again, improving the overall constellation system. And, you know, hey, look, now when you get those fancy smartwatches, if you select the GPS plus GLONASS setting, mm -hmm. You know what? The government is just going to know exactly where you're standing, what direction you're facing. They'll know what you had for breakfast. I was, will, they have, will they also give me accurate time? 
Yes. Yes? Yes. Beautiful. Timing is well if you're into that. Right. Because uh, some needs of the you accurate time may have noticed on our Twitter account <laughs> lately, uh, some people have been tweeting about the time of the show in coordinated Earth time uh, <laughs> to be differentiated from coordinated Mars time, which is, in fact, very, very different. Awkward. So it would help me, I would believe, uh, to have yeah. GPS slash GLONASS also slash coordinated Earth time <laughs> knowing exactly slash, slash, slash. where and when I am at any given Just throw point some sidereal in, time. in there as well. Are we going to need GLONASS? Beautiful. Time. Oh, probably. Always. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. And yeah. marine time. And, yes. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> Mara time. Okay. Mara time, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I kind of, Sarah, I feel like we already knew that Einstein was a genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there, like, <laughs> does he get a, a new patch for this one? Like, what's what's happening here? It is yet another gold star on the <laughs> theory of <laughs> general relativity. Okay. All right. So, in science, there is no such thing as just a theory. Because to be a theory, you have to have earned that title. Oh. Okay. Thanks. So, <laughs> general relativity has done it yet again. Mm -hmm. Researchers from the University of Portsmouth and the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation have used Hubble data and uh, information gathered from the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope to test general relativity on a galactic scale more precisely than ever before. Nice. Okay. The researchers used a prediction of general relativity called... <laughs> Gravitational lensing. Yes, oh, that's a to determine. Yes, it's to determine that they use that to determine the mass of the nearby galaxy. Brace for it. Mm -hmm. ESO three two five G 4 Henceforth to be known as E three two five. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Man, now, right? Yes. Now, nearby with this is extremely important because galaxy three two five is only about five hundred million light years away, and for scale, Andromeda is 2.5 million light years away. Ah, so yes. this is way closer then. Oh, no, it's way, way farther. Way farther. Oh, it's good. way farther. <laughs> 500 million. So sorry. No I, worries. I'm looking at your script and I still can't do this math. This is why I have you. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you. So, farther than Andromeda, but not billions and billions of light years away, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Because, okay, so the backstory. Gravitational lensing is an observable result of a massive object like a galaxy that is sitting between us on Earth and a distant light source. For this, we're going to call it a quasar. Gotcha. All right. So the mass of the galaxy between us and the quasar bends space around it, and light from the distant quasar travels on what that light would think is a straight path mm -hmm. through space. Mm -hmm. Except, okay... Light can't curve itself to enter, counteract the curvature of the space that it's driving through. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it follows the curve of space itself around the massive body between the quasar and us. What? Okay. So using <laughs> that, we can calculate the mass of the galaxy by observing how much the light from the quasar was bent. Gotcha. Cool. As Prismara right. in the chat room says, does this lensing make me look fat? <laughs> yeah, that, I'm starting to feel that way right now. It yeah, would make on. you look ringed. You would become Round. an Einstein ring, nice. but we would know exactly how much you weighed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes and no. All right, cool. Right? That's, that's really cool. All right. Okay, so if you're with me so far, this study, the scientists needed a galaxy that was nearby so that they could measure the mass in two different ways. Mm -hmm. They could test the theory. Okay, so with... E325, mm -hmm. it was close enough for us to take the, it, it had a lensed galaxy behind it, mm -hmm. so we could measure its mass that way. Using Hubble images, we used uh, the lensing around uh, E325 to calculate its mass. Mm -hmm. And then we took the images from VLT and measured the motions of stars in 325, and that's the key. It had to be close enough for us to measure the motion of stars inside the galaxy doing the lensing. Okay. Interesting. Yes. And now, with that, the numbers matched. Nice. Yes. Okay. So, the mass of the object mm -hmm. as predicted by general relativity mm -hmm. and the mass of the object as dictated by Newtonian physics, mm -hmm. uh, how massive that body has to be to keep those stars in orbit, matched within 9%. And that's, that's uh, so uh, nominal is one of those terms you yes. hear a lot in, in, <laughs> in rocketry, right? Like every, everything's nominal, this is nominal, yes. nominal. And <laughs> nominal, uh, I, I think uh, in layman's terms, you just kind of think of being as normal. Nominal equals normal. And it doesn't yes. exactly equal per se, but that's to say that um, that the area in which there could be an error is small enough that we almost don't care. Right, mm -hmm. and especially when you're dealing with such huge numbers, mm -hmm. 9% is... 
tiny. It's really, really tiny. It's so small, and it's just fantastic to so be able to measure that. That's awesome, and that's that's ex that's almost to be expected then at that point. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a theory. It's a <laughs> 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 only a theory, guys. Calm down. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. That's yeah, that's really really cool. Yeah. <laughs> nice. It's a, there's a joke in there somewhere. I'm just going to skip oh, right over it there. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. So, uh, Miss Jade. Hi. B Benny and the Benz, as uh, my husband likes to sing to this song. <laughs> of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> because of course he does. Uh, Black Hole and the Jets. Yeah. Well, what, my, are, what are we doing? What's my going original on? name was Black Hole Nom Nom, so uh -huh. I'll just throw that out there. Nice. Um, but basically, this is actually pretty cool and exciting. Uh, for the first time ever, mm -hmm. researchers have been able to track an image the violent aftermath of what happens when a poor, helpless star wanders a little too close to big, bad, supermassive black hole beyond its event horizon, and they've actually been able to track the evolution of a jet of that black hole spewing those star's guts out. And uh, yeah, there's there is an artistic <laughs> like representation. Like a hole and spitting out the bones. Is it like what's happening? More like you pulverized it into a dusty, gassy powder, and you are shooting it at about quarter the speed of the light into. Space, so which I've done on a few Saturday vomit. nights. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> All right. um, so basically, using radio and infrared telescopes, an international team of scientists led by Miguel Perez Torres of the Institute of Astrophysics of Andalusia in Spain, beautiful place, mm -hmm. and Seppo Matilla of the University of Turku in Finland, where I've always wanted to go, <laughs> were, were uh, able to capture unprecedented details on the evolution and formation of a jet emanating from a black hole as a result of stellar consumption. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so these violent occurrences, which will henceforth be known as TDEs, or tidal disruption events, it's a little bit more of a classy name, I guess, um, <laughs> happen when a star travels too close to a black hole's event horizon and is shredded apart by its massive tidal forces, resulting in a jet of stellar material ejecting into space. This hungry, hungry, supermassive black hole in question weighs in at 20 million times the mass of our sun and is located in the middle. In the middle, uh, ooh, okay. Yeah. And, so that's how scared I get when I talk about these things. Clearly, <laughs> and is located in the core of a galaxy 150 million light years away in a merger galaxy pair, ARP 299. So these are two galaxies currently coming together as one, which mm. is not as romantic as it sounds. Quite. Um, <laughs> only a small number of TDEs have actually ever really been detected in the past, um, and you. Usually we were able to see them because of their brightness in the visible wavelength versus infrared or radio. Um, and according to Matilla, as time passed, the new objects stayed bright at infrared and radio wavelengths, but not in visible light and x-rays. The most likely explanation is that the thick interstellar gas and dust near the galaxy center absorbed the x-rays in visible light and re-radiated it as infrared, which is why we're able to see it in um, the images that we just showed. <laughs> the team patiently studied this event over the span of a decade, and their patience more than paid off. It was initially observed in early 2005 as a bright flash of infrared radiation, um, and this was detected actually by the William Herschel Telescope in the Canary Islands. Um, and uh, scientists actually initially thought it was a supernova. And um, radio telescopes all over the world have been tracking what they thought, again, was a supernova. But in 2011, scientists witnessed something amazing, the elongation of the radio source. Um, and it proved that it is indeed not a supernova, but a jet with a speed that, like I said, clocks in at about quarter of the speed of light or about 75 million miles per second. You know, just a, just a, a nice, comfortable jogging pace. Right. <laughs> um, but I think that's so amazing, though, because, I mean, imagine you think you're, you're you know, imaging what is just, you know, just a supernova, which is cool, you know, but, you know, we see those. But, but then to see that source turn into, like, this stringy spaghetti, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure mm -hmm. that's not what they called it, um, it must have been pretty epic. <laughs> so TDEs like this one can give scientists a peek at the elusive environment that galaxies may have developed in in the early universe. Um, and by continuing to peer into the universe with infrared and radio telescopes, this could usher in the discovery of several more TDEs that were previously obscured by gas and dust. As Perez Torres explains, much of time, supermassive black holes are not actively devouring anything, so they're in a quiet state. Tidal disruption events can provide us with a unique opportunity to advance our understanding of the formation and evolution of the j j j j jets in the vicinities of these powerful objects. Interesting. <laughs> Done. Whoa. Boom. Mic drop. Mic drop. That just um, happened. That was dramatic. So, I'm sorry. I made so, myself uncomfortable. <laughs> there's, there's a question in the chat room that I, I want to get to that you very well may not be able to answer, and, the, and that is totally okay as well. I can uh, answer all questions. Sure. The question <laughs> Whether it'll be correct. Right. The question comes from uh, 
the username. I'm curious how long a username and it just sort of drops <laughs> off, so I guess you got your answer there. But it says, is that stellar material full of more complex atoms than what went in? Like how a supernova's energy leads to more complex atoms. Do you think oh. we can tell through spectro... Spe I can't say that word. Spectroscopy. Thank you. Sounds like a medical uh, it thing. It does. Um, the well, that's a yeah. good question, though, because, you know, in supernovae, the or at least in events that cataclysmic, like the, the temperatures and the energies get so high that, mm -hmm. you know, you do start to form those heavier elements. However, what ends up getting spewed in terms of radiation, now, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure what would actually compose that. I mean, Sarah, would you know? I, I don't. So no. it was a star I mean, that was, <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends on the original star. The star was about two times the mass of our own sun. So right. it was probably comprised of a lot of the same elements, a lot of helium and hydrogen, some oxygen in there. Yeah, and it, we, one of the- We have someone that might know. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Hey. How about that? <laughs> right. Yes. Who might know? <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> Dr. Hello. Charles, please, please, please. Enlighten en us. Enlighten us. Save oh, us. Sure. Uh, I, if I understood the question correctly, it, I, I haven't heard it exactly, but the question is that when a tidal rush disruption event occurs, could new heavy elements be formed? Right? Uh, yeah, to a certain and, extent. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead. Right. It, the answer to that question is maybe. Uh -huh. We don't know the exact <laughs> answer. <laughs> the, the problem is this. You see, in the sun, when we cook uh, hydrogen and helium and make a huge amount of energy and in the process of the byproducts of new atoms and that are formed and nuclei shall we say that that's a process known as nucleosynthesis uh, the temperature and the pressure are extremely high and it has to last for a very long time in that environment for that to occur now if you have a circumstance like this tidal disruption event there's certainly enough heat there's certainly enough pressure but is there enough time for those elements to build uh, any appreciable amount over a long period of time so we don't know the answer to that question yet. We do know that there's a huge amount of processing that goes on. So one of the things that people have been looking for in the environment of supermassive black holes for tidal disruption events or other kinds of uh, consumption events uh, <laughs> that <laughs> we are looking to see whether or not new elements are being formed, that is still under investigation. So that's a great question, actually. It's one of the forefront questions of modern astrophysics. Nice. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, My nice. goodness. That was so eloquent and just like... Well, actually, I'm so glad you stepped in. Yep. So thank you so much. You saved us. You saved me. <laughs> That's beautiful. Oh, oh, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, there is more from Dr. Charles, of course, a little bit later on. That was just uh, a teaser. Uh, exactly. Just an Case appetizer. Uh, so, so Miss Sarah, um, you're trash talking now. Like, I don't, what is happening right now? Wow. All so, right. <laughs> OK. Trash day in low Earth orbit, finally. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Okay, so the space right above Earth's atmosphere is littered with junk. Mm -hmm. Dead satellites, spent rocket pieces, various other bits of space flotsam that just haven't had the <laughs> decency to fall back to Earth yet. <sighs> All right. This doesn't pose too much of a risk to us here on Earth, as most of the small bits that fall out of the sky burn up in Earth's atmosphere. But the problem is if you are sharing that orbit. So other satellites, other humans mm -hmm. that are up there with that debris. Okay. Now, why does that sound, why is that so bad? Space junk, it's just junk, right? Little pieces of a rocket, how right, bad could that, that be? That can't hurt me. No, <laughs> the problem is how fast it's going. So space debris is moving at orbital velocity, or 17,500 miles per hour. And at that speed, a one inch screw that weighs just 1.5 grams, or one three hundredth of a pound, has the same energy as Terry Crews running at 65 miles per hour. Ha ha! Into my arms, exactly. because we will get married one day. Oh, uh, yes. Obviously. <laughs> obviously. So the big deal here is that if you, uh, if you know, like when you're in a car, for instance, and you roll down the windows because it's a lovely summer day, lovely. and yes. you've got your hand out the window, yes. like everything and you're there, flying it like you do. See, right, yes. seems totally fine, yeah. until you hit that tree branch. Yes. Right? That ripped your arm off. Right. And so, <laughs> so but the general idea is that, uh, or the, the sort of most logical thing here is like, well, yeah, but we're all traveling at the same speed, so that shouldn't hurt. It's more the perpendicularness yes. of you and said item yes. traveling at very, very high speeds. Very, very high That's speeds. what makes it the most yes. dangerous. Is that correct? <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'll make sure I, I, I totally understand. All right, so then how do we how do we do this? Where what do, what do we do about this? All right, well, that is where Remove Debris comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay, Remove Debris is a proof of concept satellite that will test four techniques for clearing that junk. 
It'll test what are called net capture for mm -hmm. trapping and reeling in derelict satellites, vision-based navigation for on-orbit target acquisition, mm -hmm. harpoon capture, which is as cool as it sounds. Uh, no kidding. <laughs> and drag sail deorbiting. Interesting. All right, so they base, they literally open a sail that catches the Earth's atmosphere, and that slows the piece of junk enough for it to fall down through the atmosphere and hopefully burn up. That's really fascinating. Okay, so the, the, one of the things that really piqued my interest on this one was the net capture, because mm -hmm. to me, you, you, you throw a net out into space, that's just going to be a tangled mess. Right. Well, they were actually counting on that. So around the edges of the net are what they call deployment masses. Mm -hmm. And those are supposed to carry the net around the target, and then once it reaches the other side, get tangled oh, in like themselves. Oh, kind of like old like Scooby-Doo uh, uh, yeah, cartoons, yeah. right? Yeah. You're trying to catch the bad guy, right? and you got the net with like the rocks on the end yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. Right? And then you can throw it on the right? It's yeah, like yeah. that. Exactly. Okay, cool. And you capture yeah. the ghoul. And then it works in space, too. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> All right, and they also combine the masses with uh, a cinch. A mechanical cinch that, as it, as the masses are tangling, it pulls the net, the neck of the net closed. Gotcha. All right. So All right. this is a real thing, yeah. Yes. So removed debris was launched on April second on a Falcon Nine, and it was brought aboard the International Space Station for assembly. It did. Ah, Some assembly was required. Yeah. This picture. <laughs> okay, that's cool. And on June twentieth, it was deployed using the Kaber Microstat Deployer. Hmm. Kaber is a commercial deployment platform mounted on the ISS and owned by NanoRacks. Love those guys. Right. Uh, <laughs> Houston-based company and. Remove Debris is the largest satellite deployed from the ISS so far. Nice. That's right. really cool. Yeah. So in the video, you may have noticed that the team are not testing this on real trash. Instead, the satellite is deploying CubeSats to use as test trash. Nice. That's because space law as it stands right now <laughs> prohibits you from interfering with anyone else's property in space, even if it's trash. Interesting. That's kind of too bad. <laughs> so what if a lot of people, uh, a lot of different uh, organizations uh, you know, even individually, if the, like if this works, right? Yes. So then that means that the European Space Agency, uh, you know, the Japanese Space Agency, uh, uh, Intel Sat, like I'm trying to think of other people who put satellites up and <laughs> blow NAS, uh, we'll go with yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, so if they all get together and they're like, hey, there's actually like a janitorial service yeah. in space, yep. they could all eth essentially individually hire yes. or do this, right? Yes. Then that's, that's really cool. Yeah. And that would be so cool too, to be a space trash man. Like right. you're operating remotely, but it's like you still have the the jumpsuit and you just go into work and I mean, time to clean up the it's time to make the dust. seeing the like <laughs> intro sequence from Titan A. Right. Well so then all right, what after they capture it, where like what happens then? Where does it all go? All right, so if the, once they've got the stuff captured and they either do the sale or whatever they can do to drop it into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's going to land, hopefully, in Point Nemo which is uh, it's in the South Pacific, mm -hmm. and it is literally the farthest point on Earth from any land. Interesting. Uh, point Nemo means point no one. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so it's also known as the space graveyard, because if you still got control of your satellite when you deorbit it, you aim for this point. So much gotcha. of the space debris that we have done deorbited intentionally is already there. Oh, so that makes, wow, that makes the Disney movie even funnier now. Right? Uh, right. Yeah, no. <laughs> I was like, Found oh, it. <laughs> right? Interesting. Oh, that's fascinating. All right, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, any more questions? We're gonna... Um, no, considering, I mean, that was very, very well packaged. Oh, thanks. Nice. So. Uh, we were, <laughs> thanks for delivering that. <laughs> if you were and watching you, live, the door of my uh, mind. Miss Jade was talking about how she was going to be doing that story, and Sarah's like, yes. well, I'm glad you didn't, because I... I got it. So I, know. Sorry. I was like, that worked out perfectly. I you did fought. It. <laughs> RPG stands. All right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a little bit of a calendar break, and when we come back, Miss Athena will be on the observation deck with her interview with Mr. Dr. Charles. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back.
Uh, hello. I wanted to make sure we give another thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens, of course, and I also wanted to acknowledge our Orbital citizens. These are the citizens who contribute $5 or more per episode. And again, if you would like to become a citizen of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. And now here is Athena with Dr. Charles Liu. Hey guys, awesome. So thank you so much, uh, Charles, for coming on today. I'm really, really stoked to talk about some of your research that you've been doing lately. So observational galaxy evolution. Tell me a little bit yeah. about uh, why you chose to go down that path for research. Well, that's a great question. Uh, it is a, a sort of a joke that every young person, when they first start doing astronomy, they want to do cosmology. They want to study the theoretical underpinnings of the entire universe. And I was no exception when I first started as a college student. It's like, hey, I think I want to do theoretical cosmology. But then the theoretical became observational, which meant that I was actually looking at stuff with telescopes and uh, tools like that instead of just staring at a computer screen. And instead of doing cosmology, the entire universe, I wound up doing galaxies, which is close. It's still pretty big. They have hundreds of billions of stars in them, uh, lots and lots of planets, gas, dark matter, things like that. They're the constituents to the universe that, say, atoms and molecules are to something big or say even cells are to the human body. So as for evolution, uh, in astronomy, evolution doesn't mean, uh, say, natural selection, where you have two different species that are battling out and whichever one wins uh, is the one that survives. But the idea that things change over time slowly, right? So evolution is just the passage of time in the overall history of the universe. So I became very interested in that as time went on. And in graduate school, that became my uh, primary focus in my career, which I still do today. And I'm happy to talk about the details of it because there's lots and lots and lots of cool stuff, that, including some of that black hole things that um, the previous uh, news broadcast was covering. There's some really neat things to talk about. Yeah, there's, there's so many awesome things. So what would um, what would, did you end up researching over the past year then that has been um, the, some of the most fascinating that you've gathered in the day that you've been analyzing? That's a great question. Uh, the past year or so, I have been doing some work that's been funded by the National Science Foundation and by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, do working on galaxies that recently collided. And by recent, I mean within the past billion years or two billion years. Uh, and what happens when galaxies collide is that usually their gas swirls into the center. Right. And then that swirling process fuels the supermassive black holes at the center and creates also, aside from this what we call active galaxy uh, in the center, the AGN, we call it, active galactic nucleus, uh, it also triggers a whole bunch of new stars forming. So you create a whole new generation of stars that now litter through this galaxy that has collided and merged. And so after that post-starburst period, what happens to the galaxies, right? Almost every galaxy in the universe, sooner or later, will undergo a collision that creates a starburst. And so what happens to it thereafter is the history of pretty much every galaxy, including our own, the Milky Way, eventually over time. I find that very interesting because we want to know, after the most violent things occur, what is the steady state? How do we return back to this calmer life, say, you're changed, you're different, but it's a longer term thing that eventually results in the ability to form things like planets and evolve life and things like that. So that's the kind of thing I've been doing. I've worked with a lot of students on this and it's been a real pleasure to do it. Uh, I really find it fascinating to find galaxies that underwent cataclysm recently in the history of the universe and that maybe galaxies that will soon uh, undergo these kinds of things. The Milky Way galaxy, our own galaxy and Andromeda which is our nearest large neighbor, uh, about two and a half million light years away, are on a collision course. Their mutual gravitational interaction will cause them to crash into one another sometime between three and five billion years from now. Now, odds are we will not be on Earth the same way that we were before, but in any case, it will be interesting to know that I think I am working on studying, trying to find out what will the Milky Way, our galaxy, look like after that collision and what are the odds of things like new stars forming life forming what the shape of our galaxy will look like what the contents will be like it's a lot of fun 
That's so cool. Um, you pretty much answered one of my next questions, which was why um, you know it's important to you to really be studying these because you mentioned you know eventually life you know other planets forming other planetary systems. But if there was one main reason as to the importance of you doing this research, what would that be? Huh. Well. That's a really great question, and a lot of my students uh, ask me these questions, especially students that aren't planning to become scientists. Like, mm. what is the value of astronomy and space studies and things like that? What, yeah. Why does it matter? And my answer is, is a, a little philosophical, but I think it's absolutely relevant and true in our modern times. The answer is that astronomy and studying these things, these galaxies that are, say, huge, much bigger than our world and their the processes that will take far longer than human lifetimes, that kind of basic curiosity-driven examination of our universe will not change the price of bread today, but it could change the course of civilization tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, everything that we do now is basically laying a groundwork for the things that will happen in the future. All the issues of um, our world, the environmental challenges, or say our technological challenges in the future, whether we'll be able to go beyond low Earth orbit, uh, whether we'll be able to populate low Earth orbit or use it in a way that will help our lives here on Earth and eventually take us out into the world, into the universe. Um, I think that those kinds of questions uh, have to start with the initial curiosity-driven uh, questions, the things that we're trying to investigate, uh, things like GPS, things like the general theory of relativity, those things that affect our daily lives, our cell phone communications, our cameras, our ability to monitor data, uh, computing power, internet, all these things came originally from wondering and investigating things that we don't really understand just yet. And then there's a second point. I'm sorry, Athena, can I go on and, and like give a second reason yeah, why I think this is important? Yeah, please do. This is amazing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the, the idea is this, right? We human beings, uh, when we're born, we know our cribs, right? Then mm -hmm. we know our bedrooms. We might know a, a small part of our homes. And then eventually we might get to know a larger part. Then we start stepping out into our neighborhoods, into the block. And then maybe someday we know our school. Then we know our towns and our cities, our countries. We're growing as we age and understand our environment and then interact with it a little bit better, right? In a more sophisticated and, and more mature kind of way. Uh, Astronomy is kind of like that, but not just for us as individuals. It's for the entire human community, right? We're just taking our first baby steps off our own world out into low Earth orbit or to the moon for brief periods of time. Now we're sending spacecraft missions to Mars, to all the other planets, to Pluto, beyond our solar system, hopefully someday, slowly but surely. Yeah. All these things are our ability to move forward out into the universe and become citizens of the entire universe. Uh, we live here. And by not keeping ourselves just tied to daily survival, thinking about larger things, we understand that you know uh, it can be the crappiest day in the world, but uh, overall it's okay, everything's gonna be fine. As long as we keep looking and growing, uh, I think astronomy, the kinds of research that I do, whether or not uh, I affect tomorrow's stock prices or anything like that, I know that I'm looking at something that is going to be a valuable thing for us all, and I'm really lucky that I can actually make a living doing it and share it with people that I get to hang out with, uh, students and uh, people like uh, all of us who are listening today. So uh, yeah. I thank you all. I appreciate it. Of course. That was such a great answer, Charles. And like I always, every time I talk with you, I always feel so enlightened because you really have this way of connecting um, the universe to humanity and us here on Earth. And I, I think that's just absolutely amazing. Um, there is a question from the chat that I do want to ask. It comes from Loopy. And they ask, how okay. do we actually know for sure the shape of our galaxy? We haven't exactly sent something far enough to take the selfie that makes Voyager jealous. I'm wondering what you have to say back to that. <laughs> that is a superb question. Uh, and it's an age old question, right? Think about the ancient Greeks. How did they know what the shape of the Earth was, right? 
uh, they're small. They only have very limited range that they can go elsewhere. And they had to make um, approximations or they had to make estimates or extrapolations. Uh, we have to do the same thing today with our Milky Way galaxy. And it kind of goes something like this. Uh, if you are, say, a fish in the ocean uh, and you're not able to actually go all the way to the edges of the ocean, um, well, uh, if you had technology, then you might be able to send a little sonar burst, right? A, a, maybe a targeted shot out in each direction. And then if you get a bounce back, eventually you'll be able to make the outline of the ocean shore wherever you are and eventually make a map of the ocean where you live. Uh, we kind of have to do that. But uh, we are lucky that things out in the universe emit light. So we don't have to send out a pulse that then comes back to us. Instead, we can just use our telescopes and look at what comes out. We take a census of the sky. Uh, and then in every direction we look, we see where the stars are and how many of them there are, what kinds they are. And then we see areas where there are no stars, areas where there are lots of them, where the light is. And over time, we're able to map using the starlight mostly, but also the light from other things, nebulae and um, even nearby galaxies. Uh, that will help us map out the overall light profile. And then we can measure the motions of both the stars inside our galaxy and also the objects outside our galaxy, like clusters of stars, globular clusters, uh, even our satellite galaxies near us, the Magellanic Clouds, for example, the Sagittarius Dwarf. Um, all these different things together, we can then understand how they move, and thus from there know approximately how far away they are, the kinds of shapes of the structures that they belong in, and putting them all together, all that information together, allows us to get that sense that we live essentially in a very thin disk of stars, and mm. we're kind of at the edge. So if you imagine a pizza mm -hmm. that's a tenth of an inch thick, then we have this big pizza here, and we're kind of near where the last pepperoni is before you head out to the nice thick crust on the outside. Uh, that's kind of how we do things. And we continue to study. We don't know a lot of things. It was only, say, within the past couple of decades that we realized that the stars in our galaxy near the center don't just form a blob like a bulge, but actually form a bar. And it, this bar is really, I'm, I'm blocking myself, don't worry, it's not important. It doesn't matter what I look like, what the bar of the galaxy is. So you have the bar here, which is kind of short. But what it does is the spiral arms come off the edge of the bar, as opposed to coming right out of the central bulge. So these things are being learned all the time. Uh, some of your uh, listeners, the, some of the audience may uh, have heard about something called Gaia, second data release, uh, just within the past month or so. Uh, the European Space Agency and its collaborators, all the people who worked on the Gaia mission, have now released a map of 1.7 billion stars with a B wow. in our galaxy. So the ability to understand the structure and the shape of this part of our universe, this part of our galaxy, has grown by leaps and bounds. Uh, of course, there are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, so we still have a long way to go. That's so cool. Now, um, so I think that that's a really good answer. You obviously were saying as far as being able to visually see the light that's already being emitted, um, you know, from from the universe, from these stars. But what about the things we can't see? There's a, qu a question here from Henny's Vorwerp um, off of Twitch, and they ask, "Do you always see dark matter separate from normal matter in such collisions, referring to the the galaxy collisions?" Great question. Uh, by the way, that, that username, Hani Furver, uh, those of you who know, that was a, a citizen scientist named Hani van Arkel uh, from the Netherlands, who through the Galaxy Zoo project was able to discover a new kind of object that others had not yet seen before, and it's known as Hani's Furver. Uh, so cool name. Good call. <laughs> uh, the issue of dark matter and luminous matter moving differently has been a topic of great uh, research over the past several years. Um, in, in the past few decades, when we've confirmed that there is a lot of material in the universe that is there, but doesn't emit any light, and, and electromagnetic radiation of any kind, as far as we can tell, uh, that material has, for the most part, been uh, connected to the uh, luminous matters, the atoms, the molecules, the uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, neutrinos, things like that. Um, now, what we are understanding is that sometimes those things can 
decouple just a little tiny bit. Most of the time, though, they're all still quite attached. There's a very well-known study where you have the dark matter and the luminous matter separating as two clusters of galaxies are coming together. We're not just talking about two galaxies colliding, but each cluster has hundreds, maybe thousands of galaxies, and they're surrounded by huge halos of dark matter. And this dark matter is not emitting any light, but it's acting completely gravitationally like all the rest of the material. So as the dark matter is coming through and they're combining these two clusters becoming one again i'm blocking my face i'm sorry that's okay uh, as we do that uh the gas that's not co coalesced into stars necessarily they're coming through but because the gas interacts with one another they have this sort of tidal the friction interaction between them they're coming together at a different rate than the dark matter coming together so that's one way to confirm the existence of dark matter, to make sure that, yes, the, the material that is bound by gravity is moving differently from the material that might be affected by things other than gravity in a significant way. So most of the time, the dark matter and the luminous matter move together. But a lot of the time, because there's so much more dark matter than luminous matter, you see motions even when you don't see stars. Uh, and that is a kind of decoupling but the, this kind of dramatic decoupling between, say, dissipative effects, uh, non-gravitational effects on luminous matter, which we can see compared to uh, the dark matter that we can detect using the gravitational, uh, say, signatures of this motion, uh, is getting very interesting. I think is really cool. Uh, the, the specific term for dark matter and luminous matter moving uh, separately from one another, one term is, is, is called velocity bias. Mm -hmm. And there's been a bunch of papers p published about that over the decades. I don't know where the status of that research is yet at this moment, but it's kind of cool. Velocity bias, okay, that's pretty cool. I like that, I'll be researching that later. So yes. um, I understand that uh, sometimes in some of your free time, you uh, like to research quasars. And is it yes. that you hunt for quasars? Tell me a little bit about that and uh, okay. why you why you do that. <laughs> okay. That, do do you remember the television brand Quasar? The television brand? Yes. No, there was I... a there was a quas there was a company called Quasar. I think it was based in Wisconsin that made televisions. Okay. And and Some people the remember, commercial yes. would come on. Be, Quasar. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. <laughs> It is very cool. Uh, but uh, yes, a quasar is a quasi-stellar quasi radio source. And it's actually, as a term, it's relatively new. Um, the idea was that you find these things because they are supermassive black holes that sit in the centers of massive galaxies. And when matter falls into them, the matter that comes close but doesn't fall all the way in can achieve enormous energies and as a result, we'll release all kinds of radiation, uh, physical jets, and just be uh, a massively influential thing in the evolution of that galaxy. So I was interested in quasars originally as a way to understand the galaxies inside them. But there's another way to use quasars as well because they're really bright. Okay, Part of the reason they became known as quasi-stellar radio sources is because they were like stars, even though it was realized that they are millions and billions of light years away from the Earth. They looked like stars that were only a few light years away. Why were they so small and compact? Right? And it turns out that because they're at the centers of galaxies and they're powered by supermassive black holes, which are small, uh, even the most massive supermassive black holes are only slightly larger than our solar system. And as a result, uh, you look at them and you could swear that they look like stars, and yet they are producing tremendous amounts of radio energy and X-ray energy and even visible light, which you would only expect from tremendously powerful sources. And so the concept of the quasar as a beacon in the universe is a fascinating one, too. If you can find a black hole uh, that is undergoing a quasar stage of activity, uh, and it happens to be, say, billions of light years away, as it shines toward us, it will pass through clouds of gas, which otherwise would be invisible to us because they uh, don't emit enough light on their own. They, they aren't conducting nuclear fusion, for example, not enough star light is coming through. But uh, just as you can shine, say, a flashlight beam through a cloud of chalk dust and you can see the, the dust being lit up, Right. By the same token, if you shine through, you can see the effects of the quasar's light on 
the quasar light um, by all of this dust, right? The, the, the dust or the gas will have uh, atomic interactions with them or scattering interactions with this light. And as a result, you can actually study the non-luminous but not dark matter component of the universe. Whoa. Okay, as it turns out, yeah, it, it's really cool. Um, and, and it's what's allowed us to realize that for all of the wonderful energy that comes and, and the amount of matter that uh, is in uh, galaxies, uh, mostly powered by starlight or supermassive black holes and so forth, there's about as much mass that's just sitting out there in intergalactic space in clouds, uh, vast clouds, as large or even larger than galaxies. They're just kind of sitting there, uh, waiting perhaps someday to get to a point where they will form stars and new galaxies and perhaps new planets, new people, new plants, cool things like God, that. That's so, so it, cool. the, yeah, hunting for quasars is a fun thing to do for that reason, because you find a nice grid of quasars all around, and then you can use them literally as searchlights to look for the hidden matter in the universe. That's so awesome. Um, so Destructor1701 in the chat says, realized just after that Star Trek episode centered around a visit to a quasar. So because I read this uh, in the chat, I want to actually bring up, you're, you're quite savvy with pop culture, Charles. I definitely <laughs> noticed. So I really want to get into, yeah, you, you, yeah it's, it's really cool. So I wanted to ask you um, how important you think it is um, for like science fiction, films, movies, novels, even like pop culture, um, like shows today and music, how important of a role that plays for prospective scientists or, or possibly students that don't know their path just yet. Oh, it is the best. I am. Uh, I am not really a pop culture expert, Athena. Uh, it, it, you know that. You know me real well. In fact, you know, I, I should tell that. Okay, if I, if I have a few moments, all y'all, I, I want to share with you how cool Athena is uh, and was uh, as a, as a research scientist. You, you should know this. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit before. But Athena is an astrophysicist too. Uh, as a student, she did astrophysics research. And she was one of my best students. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you all about that if I get a chance, okay, Athena? I know you're okay. the host and, and I'm the guest, but I want to yeah, have a chance to tell, you, tell people about that. <laughs> but to answer your question real quick, yes. okay. Um, pop culture is something that I like. It's not something that yeah. I research so that I can be you know, cool in, in right. communicating science or anything. And, and that's always been true for me. And so for that reason alone, uh, I think that we all should love the pop culture, the science fiction, the the songs, the music, uh, the art, um, just uh, anything that has to do with the inspiration of what the universe can provide for us is a great thing. And I think that we are all better scientists for it if we understand its impact on the public. Uh, there's a really unfortunate um, stereotype that uh, it's, it's a bias that even we scientists fall into a lot, where scientists are supposed to be staid, they're supposed to be antisocial, we're supposed to be wearing our white lab coats on distant mountaintops in the middle of nowhere, and we talk to no one, and we have really bad haircuts, and then we just sort of stare out in the universe or, or stare at our computer screen and make like massive discoveries that change the universe. That, that's not really how science uh, goes about and, and how it should go about. Yes, it's true that there are wonderful examples of that uh, in the overall world. Uh, and it's also probably true that if you want to study anything, uh, the scientific or otherwise, uh, that's scholarly or academic or, or sophisticated, deep, sometimes you are working uh, by yourself, alone, thinking deep thoughts and, and not interacting and socializing at that very moment, right? But mm -hmm. overall, if we don't have uh, these other things that make us who we are, uh, it also will detract from our abilities or our interests uh, as scientists. Uh, Albert Einstein, uh, who, as we heard earlier, is really a genius after all, right, uh, wrote in 1930 in, in an article that was published in the New York Times that he said the origin of all art and science, the, the, all the greatest creative endeavors of humans uh, come from that same impulse where we are like amazed by uh, the mysteries of that surround us whether those mysteries include artistic things or scientific things or philosophical human relations, all of it matters. And from that same 
a wellspring of inspiration. We can lead to many, many different things. And there's nothing written down anywhere uh, that's reputable that says that you can't do lots of different things at once. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you, Athena, as well as being a great scientist, uh, have moved on to doing this other stuff. But your ability to be a communicator of science is greatly enriched. A communicator of any kind, really. It's not just science, right, Athena? Uh, all of it. Because you have this extra depth of experience that you are exploring the sense of the mysterious, looking at things and going, wow, what the heck is that? How the heck does that work? What does that mean about us? So I am 100% in favor of that, and, and you knew that. Right? Yeah, I mean, honestly, a lot of my, obviously, my, my growth and inspiration really came from you being my mentor. So I want to ask you what you think of the, the value of, of mentorship when it comes to students, um, whether in high school or once they get to college level, as opposed to just having you know, a student go to, to school and be in a classroom and do you know, exams and, and, and homework, uh, what the value really is in having a mentor to pursue their careers, specifically for science. Oh, it's so important. I, I think this is tough, and, and I might get in trouble with some of my fellow professors about this kind of thing, but education uh, originated, really, uh, university education, but all kinds of education, really originated with the idea that you had to convey information to people, right? We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, there are so many ways to get information in our modern 21st century society that just the transfer of information from one person to the next is not nearly as crucial as it was, say, centuries ago in our society. What instead needs to happen is for people to understand what it's like to do what you do, right? So what is it like? What are you thinking about? What are the things that inspire you or, or humble you or, or uh, motivate you to do the kinds of things that you care about or are interested in? And, and that's the kind of thing that I think is my most important task. I mean, I'm just one guy. I, I can make massive discoveries if I'm very fortunate and I work very hard. But in the end, my contribution is tiny. It's just one little bit in the entire amount of what still needs to be learned. So if I can help other people do stuff and become better than me, I want all my students to be better than me in every single way. I want them to be taller. I want them to be smarter. I want them to make more discoveries. I want them to make more money. Uh, I want them to you know, win more awards. Because what I can do is to help those folks who are uh, rich with talent to get that motivation and that understanding of what they want to do. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So now it's time, by the way, Athena. I now have to take over and tell people about you. What? Is why? That okay? No. <laughs> yeah, why? why? <laughs> Get used to it. Okay. So, uh, uh, as you'll know from my bio on this thing, I teach at the College of Staten Island, in addition to my work at the uh, American Museum of Natural History and the Hayden Planetarium. And Athena was a student in one of my introductory astronomy classes. Uh, right. Well, you remember AST 102 in that weird classroom, 4 and 218 at the College of Staten Island, right, Athena? Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed. Now, Athena is, is not a, at that time, uh, was not majoring in any science. But astronomy 102 was a general education requirement, right? And you and a lot of other students were taking this class to fulfill an education requirement. And all I did was to show you all how cool the universe is and how we study it a little bit, right? I tell people, look, um, you love math. You love physics. You have no idea that you do. What you don't love is math class or math tests or math homework or, or math teachers, right? It's that stuff. So the material you love uh, and you are good at and it's just other people, or maybe whatever environments you've been in, have convinced you that you're not good, right? Uh, that you're not able to, or this is not for you. So that's all I tried to communicate in my classes. And Athena, as it turns out, everybody, was one of my very best students that year. I think you scored a perfect score on your final exam, or maybe you missed one question, I think it was. <laughs> um, uh, I think, yeah, of all the students in there, I think there were two students that, that maybe three, that either scored perfect on the final or missed one uh, one point 
And I think you were you were definitely one of those three. I don't remember if you were the one that got the perfect score. But anyway, Athena <laughs> turns out to be really liking this stuff and asked a lot of great questions. And I just sort of said, you know what? Hey, Athena, you want to do some of this? You know, give it a try. See if you're interested in studying uh, um, astrophysics and actually doing research. And you said yes, right, Athena? You know, tell us a little bit about your own personal experience with astronomy, because right. what happened was that she wound up coming joining our research work at the Museum of Natural History, and uh, for was it a full year? Uh, uh, did some amazing stuff, uh, researching stars and uh, the evolution of brown dwarfs, things like that. Yeah, what, right. what did you do? Remind yes. me, please. Right. So Remind honestly, us all. Yeah, so well, there was an incredible CUNY program, City University of New York, um, that really had mentors that would mentor their students, um, which is incredible that um, obviously we got to be part of that. And it went to the American Museum of Natural History and were able to conduct research on their NASA space grants and the National Science Foundation. So there was a lot of incredible students that were there and were able to be able to conduct research in whichever field they really wanted to, um, or whichever. There was also uh, biology there, and there was a few other uh, subjects too, not just astrophysics, which um, was really incredible. And it obviously, of course, really moved me, uh, and, and I know it moved a lot of students also to pursue the careers that they really wanted to in science. So it definitely was an overall incredible um, like few summers, actually, of, of doing that research. Mm -hmm. So again, thank you so much for that. Um, but now we're to, to get towards uh, the, the end of our interview. Uh, I do oh, have... no. Do we have to stop talking? Well, I still have so many stories questions. to tell about you, Athena. You well, know? <laughs> I, do, I do have a question, though, as, because speaking of students and mentorship, I do want to ask yes. you, what would be if you had to choose like one of the most meaningful pieces of advice to give students that um, are wanting to pursue a career in researching like to study the stars or the cosmos what would be that one piece if they're on the, on the bridge right now of trying to decide whether to do it or not oh i don't know um for every person is different right athena yes i mean for you right um, I don't know. I, I can't remember all the things that I told you and that you were very patiently listening to me, whether or not I was spouting nonsense or anything like that. <laughs> um, is there a single piece of advice? I, I think that um, hmm. realizing that there are a lot of people that are going to tell you what you can and cannot do in life mm -hmm. and that you just have to decide that, you know what, uh, you're wrong. I can do literally anything. And eventually, if I do something for a period of time and realize that I want to do something else instead for a period of time, or uh, if I want to change my focus or do something else, take what experience I have and run with it in a different direction, you just go ahead and do it. And you cannot be afraid of other people, even though the temptation is great to say, you can't do this, you can't do that. Uh, mm -hmm. The most um, frustrating thing I see is when students are convinced by others that whatever they're doing is not valuable or whatever their skills are, it's not enough. Uh, and I counsel everybody, say, look, you come here, you do things. And as you know, Athena, there are plenty of my students over time, research students and other classroom students who wind up not being scientists, right. but that's okay. In fact, that's great, right? How many scientists do we need anyway, right? We need people who communicate, we need people who talk, we need people who govern, we need people who do other things in addition to the research as well. But if you have that experience, you say, I'm not afraid, I'm gonna do this for a period of time and whatever I get out of it, I will have made a contribution and it will have enriched me. Uh, and you just go ahead and do that. And I think that's the right answer. Uh, there will always be opportunities to turn and do other things and new things. And at the same time, there will always be obstacles, right? There will be naysayers. There will be uh, challenges that you have to face. And then you ask yourself, okay, how do I overcome this challenge? And sometimes you ask for help. Sometimes you talk to people. Sometimes you uh, try to look at things a different way. Uh, and you move on and do other things in your life. Uh, for short periods or for long periods, and you may loop back or you may not, it doesn't matter. The important thing is to realize that you are good at that stuff, right? Uh, if you are, uh, I don't know how many times I, I've received comments from people saying, oh, well, I'm no good at physics, or I'm no good at math, right? And I'm no good at computers, uh, to which I say, no, that is not correct, that you're not any good at it. If the answer is that you're not good at it yet, mm -hmm. that you can be if you want to be, you can choose not to be, or you can choose to be, uh, and it may take time, it may take effort, you may have to overcome obstacles, but it's not that you can't do it, 
It's not that you aren't able to, no matter what anybody tells you, that's not true, right? Instead, what you are is not good at it yet. And so find people who will help you with that and do it yourself and keep pushing forward. Design your own future. Um, it's kind of inspirational in a sense uh, that it has nothing to do with astronomy in specific. Uh, but you know what I mean, Athena? I mean, you yes. know what I mean, better yes, perhaps precisely. than anybody else. I mean, as, as an awesome student in so many things and including science and contributing in scientific research and then moving on to doing other cool things that you're doing today uh, is really cool. And it's an example of the best kind of thing that can happen from an education. And and I'll mention one more thing, okay, Athena, because you know, I want to tell people this. Um, a couple of years ago, I was teaching a, uh, a seminar for budding scientists, for people who wanted to be scientists. And uh, Athena very kindly came to the class. Uh, we had a special sort of hour with her where she talked about her career path and the kinds of things that she did, both scientifically and otherwise. And at the end of it, the students are all so moved. They, they also appreciated you. You know that, right? And there was one student I remember that came to you and she was like, oh, can I give you a hug? You, what you're saying and who you are is so what I needed to know right now, so what I needed to hear, the kinds of things that matter so much to me. Um, so mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that you can do too. That's what anybody can do as a result of their education. And uh, that student, by the way, Athena, yeah. uh, just graduated from college and oh, she's amazing. now going on to get a PhD in astrophysics at Harvard. And, uh, you oh, know, you, so rock. Happy here. you rock. Very simply. And That's all of awesome. you, every, all of you who are doing this yeah. podcast, all of you who are doing this kind of work, you're making the difference. And mm -hmm. that's what it is by convincing people that, that you can do it if right. you want to, you don't have to do it if you don't want to, but in the end, it's only a matter of what you haven't done yet. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's that's incredible, and uh, um, I, I, that's great to hear. Obviously, that you know she went on a pursuit her, her to get her PhD, and I think that obviously that's what um, you know a lot of us really agree with on this show, and and you know the, the citizens of tomorrow that are watching right now, like we all understand, you know, the umbrella of space and of space exploration and how empowering it is to each of us. And um, so I love that we're constantly, everyone's able to make those connections with each other, whether it's, you know, you're at a coffee shop and you're talking about space or, you know, obviously a seminar, wherever it is. So that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, I love that. All. So, Athena. yeah, there's a few um, questions we love asking. There's no wrong answers, um, but they're okay. super open ended. So, the first one is What is your favorite space mission, past, present, or future? Oh, geez. My <laughs> personal favorite has to be STS 6, the first launch of Challenger, uh, the space shuttle. Wow. And that's because I have a personal experience with it. Yes, this was 1982. Right. Columbia had already gone up five times, if I recall correctly. And remember, all my facts and figures may be messed up, depending on how bad my memory is right now of that event. But um, the sixth launch was going to be uh, Challenger, the first launch of a second space shuttle. And my family, just at that time, as it turns out, was going on a family vacation. We're driving down all the way to Florida uh, to see uh, friends and then eventually see Disney World and Epcot Center, which was pretty new at that time. And we, the day we arrived into Florida, uh, Florida itself, they were like, well, we have like half a day. What should we do? And I bugged and pestered and I begged my family uh, to take the, uh, you know, that was a 1977 Dodge Aspen, I think we all drove in, uh, to Cape Canaveral to watch the shuttle launch. And my family was like, oh, come on, we can't get close. We're going to be far away. You can't see a thing. No one's going to be there. It's going to be boring. It's going to be whatever. And I was like, no, you got to go. Please, 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 please. And to this day, I'm grateful both to my parents and to my little brother and my older sister who like put up with me uh, and agreed that we would go over to Cape Canaveral and go see this thing. I remember uh, we finally managed to find some parking because, of course, all the shorelines were all crowded across like a body of water. I don't even know which one from the launch pad, but we were there with a whole bunch of other people. I remember having conversations with them. There were people in campers, people in cars just like us and kind of sitting around the side and in picnic chairs and just sort of watching. And of course, there's no live feed at that time, no internet. People were listening to the radio to make sure that it was uh, still going on. And there's the launch things going and old fashioned, all stuff we see on, on YouTube from the old launches. And like we, of course, the 
the launch tower itself was this big, like way, way far away. <laughs> we could only see it by binoculars. And, and fortunately, uh, some people with nice binoculars, you know, lent them to us and we could take a look and like, wow, there it is on the launch pad and everything. And then uh, it actually, we were able to hear the, the countdown and over the radio. And then the launch happened and it was going up. And again, little tiny thing, right? Like a, like a match, it looked like from where we are. But we all were very, very excited. We didn't hear the sound. I don't even remember to this day if I heard the sound of it at all because we were so far away. It made have heard a low rumble many seconds later. But it was going up. And I was there with my Kodak Instamatic camera, you know, the 110, like taking pictures, going up. And I was like, whoa, this is so cool. Um, and that probably, uh, if I think about, the overall launching and stuff that was my favorite one because that was the one that I was closest to as a human being and I was a kid and I will always remember it. Wow that's such an awesome story man that must have been so cool to see even though it was super tiny but I'm sure it was moving. Um, so the yeah. next question would be human or robotic exploration of the cosmos? For now robotic eventually human. It is awesome. inevitable that we human beings go out there. Right now there's still a lot of things that we haven't quite figured out yet going as a human being right now is probably too risky. We don't want to, you know, go. I know there are plenty of people who are willing to go if they even if they have a, a large fraction percentage chance of not surviving. But really what we should do is to make sure that we can be as safe as we possibly can. Uh, in the meantime, though, our, our robotic explorations are superb. They are excellent. They are extensions of ourselves out into space. Uh, our eyes on Mars, for example, through Curiosity Rover, uh, or um, say our view of Saturn's rings through Cassini uh, as it was plunging through in its final uh, grand entrance, grand exit, whatever we call that uh, uh, grand finale. Uh, that is really beautiful for now, and I'm quite satisfied up to this point. And then when the time comes, we should go out there and take a look ourselves. Yes, I definitely agree with that. Awesome. So where should we go next? Uh, we as in we humans or we as in using our spacecraft? Uh, both. Okay. We humans should next go to Mars. Okay. I think we can go back to the moon if we want to, but there really is no need. Uh, going to Mars is the next step. I think it'll happen within my lifetime that there will be about as constant a presence of humans on Mars as there was a presence of humans on the moon. Uh, they, they were there, they stayed for a period of time, they picked up rocks and so on. But I think Mars is a different situation than the moon because it takes so long to get there and so long to get back, right? Difference between a few days and the better part of a year, uh, just a, a one-way trip as a huge difference. So when we go, we want to do it right. We want to get there. We want to be able to come back on a regular basis. We want to be able to survive there uh, for a long period of time if we need to. Uh, and so it's a thing that will happen. I, I'm very confident it will happen in my lifetime. I'll be very happy to see it. Uh, and so let's do that for sure. Okay. Yes. Uh, and, and, and all the young folks out there, uh, we're counting on you. Sorry. Uh, we old folks, we... I don't know if we have the vision and the uh, ingenuity and the stick to itiveness to do it. I hope we do, but <laughs> if we don't, it's up to you all, young people. So please do it. And, yes. and by young, I mean anybody under the age of like me. Okay, which is <laughs> uh, the, there are a lot of you. So and, and I appreciate that, all of you who do that. Uh, in the longer uh, t distance category, like non-humans, mm -hmm. where we need to go is uh, well, wait. This excludes places we've already gone, right? Or already planning to go. Uh, like spacecraft that are already set up. For example, there's a great spacecraft mission that's being designed to go to Europa. Right. Right. To go mm -hmm. to the icy moons of Jupiter to really land there or to figure out what the situation is as far as extraterrestrial life goes in those areas. So um, that's something that I probably don't want necessarily to duplicate and to say, well, we have to go there for sure, uh, because we're already planning that. So everywhere in the solar system is a place that we should go. Uh, eventually, it'd be nice to go even further beyond that. Um, I would really love to see uh, more information about the heliopause, this bubble of ionized gas that sort of marks the boundary of our solar system beyond the solid objects like the dwarf planets and the Kuiper Belt objects and things like that. Um, there's just so much to do, and uh, I look forward to being part of all that. It's a lot of fun to think about. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So for the very last question is why space? Why space? Yes. Why space? 
because it's there. <laughs> because it represents everything that we can do that we haven't done yet, whether or not we uh, know what we're getting into, mm -hmm. when we look up, when we look into space, when we think about space itself and the universe as a whole, it makes us something more than just organisms attached to a planet, wondering where our next meal is coming from. It elevates us to the level that I like to think that we humans are capable of. And, and space represents that aspiration, which I think we all should be thinking about for our future, our legacy on the existence of all of us, both individually and collectively. That's why space. Wow, well, that is an incredible answer. <laughs> I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, well, Charles, thank you so much uh, for coming on oh, the show. thank you, Athena. This and, was such and, a good conversation. Again, I, let me just say, it is, I am so proud to have been one of your professors. Uh, and you, what you have done and what your colleagues and friends are doing is so valuable to us all, uh, not just me as an astronomer, an astronomy professor, astrophysicist, whatever, but like all of us. And so keep on keeping on, thank you, and I can't wait to see what you're doing next. Thank you so much, Charles. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick break, and when we come back, we're gonna look at your comments and questions from last week's show. Okay, bye guys. <laughs> Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, let's explore the science of tomorrow. Like just before comments, I want to make sure I give another thank you to our Escape Velocity citizens. I also want to give a huge thank you to our Orbital citizens, and then of course our Suborbital citizens. And these are the people who contribute two dollars and fifty cents per episode. And every little bit helps. If you would like to be able to contribute to the show, and you know, kind of feel like you're in on all the awesomeness that you see here today, feel free to head on over to Patreon.com/tmr. R O, trying to give everybody enough time because Ben is adjusting all of the cameras as we are here live in the studio. <laughs> uh, so last week we had a really great, really, really great. If you missed that one, please go back and watch it. Just like I will say the same thing next week about this week on 11.24, <laughs> uh, Miss Kim Stedman, on the, on the, the different personalities of the JPL rovers. We did cover a lot more ground than that, of course. Uh, <laughs> But that was kind of one of the, the sort of more defining moments, I think, of that particular uh, of that particular uh, interview, uh, which was really great because it's one of those things where um, you know it was funny, uh, Mr. Doctor Charles uh, just <laughs> talked about how, how his one of his favorite missions uh, was was the Challenger mission, the first Challenger mm -hmm. mission. And I thought, yeah, STS-6, like, that's, like, super random. Yep. Just kind of yeah. out of the air. Like, I don't even remember STS-6. And then that story was really, really fascinating. And uh, I think uh, after after a while, after talking to a lot of different, uh, I don't mean this badly, but shuttle huggers, uh, each, <laughs> each order kind of has a little bit of a different personality. So it was interesting yeah. to talk about the rovers also kind of having a little bit of a different personality as right there as well. So that was really, really, really cool. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. The interview from last week. It was so good. That was awesome. Uh, all right, so uh, questions and comments about last week's show. Well, the first one comes off of Reddit, actually, from Frog Game Zuck? Frogamazog? Frogamazog. Frogamazog. Great. <laughs> Thank you, ladies, for helping me out with that one. Uh, says, this is interesting, but honestly, I found the next piece on space station concepts to even to be even more interesting. I think space tourism offers a very real possibility for growth in the launch market over the next 10 years or so, now that the Falcon 9 is approaching a fully if, f approaching full maturity with Block 5 and the first Falcon Heavy has flown, it is much more realistic for designers to plan commercial sp uh, stations specifically for tourism, uh, which is, which is, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. 
right? Like, if you were going to be on a tourism station, like, what are you expecting to see? <laughs> oh my gosh, I would just want everything. Yeah, <laughs> I want everything there. Um, but I like the the point that uh, this person brings up about obviously the Falcon Nine Block Five mm -hmm. uh, with obviously the new con configuration. It's going to be able to launch and land multiple times without having to really be worked on. That's mm -hmm. the goal. Um, too much, um, which is exactly what we need in order to have space tourism right? for transportation. So mm -hmm. I'm like, yes. Um, but yeah, I, I would probably be one of the first people if we could go for, for tourism to go. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Nice. I mean, it'll probably cost a lot. You think but, you, you need know. a passport? I was yeah. I was wondering about a couple space times passport. Ago. Yeah, you know, space cool that space would look. Port? It would say Earth. Oh. We, there it is again. Person. Basically, <laughs> twinsies. It's appropriate we're sitting on weird yes, side of the table. To make sure you two are <laughs> separated. We might fuse into one. <laughs> That's <Jera>. awesome. <laughs> would, uh, yeah, would you go? Uh, yes. Yeah. That's a question. Of course. It, yeah, I think it is a question. I know it, it really is, but it's, it's such a rea it's such a a reflex for me. Of course, you yeah. go to space if you have the opportunity. Is it the maiden yeah. voyage, though? Like, no, I think if we're talking <laughs> space like, tourism, and, it's like, pretty we've, safe. We've done it. Yeah. We did, we did. Oh, you wouldn't be on the first. I would totally be on the first. Yeah. I, if I could afford Great. that, I, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to have the experience of, I don't know, being up there, being off of the earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we are from this, but to be able, but we're also Let's go from there. there. Right, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Going, it's almost even going more home than we are right now. Right. In a mm. sort of, you know, that's logical way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Didn't know that's where we were going with this, but right. yes, that's great. <laughs> I, I, love that. more more. I did. <laughs> Don't let me talk. No. Don't let me talk. <laughs> Stop, that's funny. <laughs> All right, next uh, comment comes off of, also it comes off of Reddit, from Cap MSFC. That is really difficult to say. <laughs> the idea that contamination ruins our ability to search for life doesn't make sense to me, and in my opinion, only exists in the scientific community because of the way robotic exploration has been limited to, limited to biomarkers. If this is life on Mars, I consider it a necessity that we go to study it in person with all the equipment and processes to isolate contamination from the indigenous life. That's an interesting way of looking at. It. I can, I sort of I can see that point of like, <laughs> look, you know, my DNA is my DNA, but you know, you can you can see the lines of like, this is the part that came from my mom, this is the part that came, came from my dad to a certain extent. Like, no. So so no? I actually. Uh, no. So for, right. for me, this is uh, <laughs> no great. <laughs> this one has me going because uh, just. Okay, there's a story from Apollo 12. You're right, you said they, don't let you talk. So, so. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I'm totally joking. <laughs> okay, so the Apollo 12 astronauts, part of their mission was to go to Surveyor 3 mm -hmm. and retrieve parts of it. Yep. Because they wanted to uh, look at what kind of damage the radiation exposure outside of Earth's magnetic shield, mm. what it was doing to the craft. And so they went, they brought pieces back, and one of the pieces they brought back was a camera. And they found bacteria on the camera. Okay. Was it moon bacteria? I was saying, like, I really <laughs> said about it, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. So was it moon bacteria? Was it contaminated on its way back? Mm -hmm. mm. Even with people there, in situ, we won't know if it's Martian life or mm -hmm. if it's contamination from Earth. Uh, if we, uh, un unless it's so drastically different genetically than anything that we have on Earth, which... Ooh, it, Andromeda strain style. Right? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then we might not be able to know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, I think the uh, anti-contamination processes that JPL go through, the clean room build, all of it, I think it is totally necessary. Especially if you think Mars has the potential to be an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And if we are just like, whatever, because in tight, right? Uh, <laughs> right, right. If on Mars, we could, our bacteria, our germs, our skin cells might be hostile to whatever life already exists there. Exactly. So we want to do our best to preserve anything that's there uh -huh. before we. Right. Just assume there's nothing there, or we'll figure it out when we get there. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I mean, and that was like a huge stipulation too. When they, I mean, as Dr. Charles Liu was mentioning the Europa mission, mm -hmm. because it's like, oh my gosh, yeah. imagine we do discover this amazing, beautiful, complex ecosystem underneath the ice. Mm -hmm. Oops, right. and we just destroyed about sixty percent of it. Oh, shucks, yeah. Yeah. you know, because it's it is a serious threat there. I mean, yeah. um, we take for granted like kind of the complexities of our ecosystem and how like 
you know, like, th and as you said, even something as simple as like a skin cell or something biological yeah. can like completely eradicate like a certain yeah. goodness knows. So, right. Yeah, I think it's important <laughs> to maybe do a little squeaky clean there. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Jared Head uh, has something to say. <laughs> no surprise there. Let me just lean over and read all of this for you. Uh, it says, no one has any clue what life may look like. The assumption that it that it may be different, but it, it I can't talk. The assumption <laughs> is that it may be different, but it also may be indistinguishable from life on Earth, which Sarah said wonderfully. It, if it is indistinguishable from Earth life, then you are lax on contamination pre and you are lax on contamination procedures. Then you have no ground to stand on that you found life indigenous to Mars. Whew. Okay. Dang. Got it. I'm yeah. Ooh, wow. All right. My, yeah, thank you. Yeah. You just throw his phone at the window. So, so what Sarah and Jade said. Got it. Thank you, Jared. I appreciate. It. No, no, no. I mean, uh, obviously, all joking aside. Yeah. No, no, no. That makes sense. That that totally makes sense. If it is exactly the same, but we didn't go through the processes, and we don't know if we found something new or we found something really, really old. And so that's, well, that's what I'm wondering, though. If we do find something on Mars, or say, like, if you know, you said Apollo missions, so that would be the moon. Yeah. If there was bacteria found there, uh, wouldn't we? know all the bacteria that already exists on Earth, at least have like record of it, how would we know that we found it? Like, If we found something from Mars, wouldn't we be like, well, this is nothing like what we've seen on Earth. It has to be from Mars. Where would that distinction come in? So that's one of, I mean, yes, that could right. happen. And we would know, like, this is Martian. This, right. is, this DNA is not carbon-based, yeah. whatever it is. Um, but if it is similar, and also one of the, I should say, one of the possible explanations for life evolving on Earth is panspermia. Exactly, right? and that's so, what I was yeah. thinking right now. Then then it would be similar. Right. Uh, so, so, yeah. so whatever term you just yes, used, yes, I yes. need to yeah, hear yeah, again, yeah. So, and I need you to explain that to <laughs> cool. me. Oh. Panspermia. It's as kinky as it sounds. No, it's <laughs> I mean, yeah, kind of. Right? So it is the, it's the hypothesis that life on Earth it was n didn't originate here. Right. That mm -hmm. the building blocks as we know them, the proteins, amino acids, they mm -hmm. came with the comets that okay. gave us our water. Sure. And mm -hmm. so those same comets would have deposited those on other worlds throughout right, the solar system. Right, because they were water comets. Exactly. Right. Okay. So then Wait. Martian life would genetically look, it would look similar, similar to, to Earth. Earth life. It might have evolved. Yeah, and it might have even evolved similarly as well. I mean, right. looking kind of, I mean, just like geophysically at the yeah. two planets. Yeah. And so that's what I always thought about that too. Like if there is, if we are going to find life on other planets, um, yeah. you know, microbial, bacterial, or otherwise, it it's gonna, yeah, you're right. It's gonna be hard to, unless we find it there. Like, like say you have a rover and we find it away from the physical rover versus, oh, it got stuck to us and then it came back. Right. You know, then then it's like, well, yeah. it would be hard to distinguish because they'd probably look very similar, yeah. if not indistinguishable. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, we might end up you know, running across a green alien that's, you know, pew, pew, get this <laughs> rover out of the way. Can I be I'm the first one? I want to be the, uh, I want to, oh, God, what's oh, his name? Oh, now she wants to go first. I want to be the, uh, <laughs> I want to be, I want to be the Captain Kirk of uh, discovering alien species. And, you know, uh, <laughs> I'll be the Gord. <laughs> uh, amazing. If that doesn't just sum up this I cast am. of characters, I don't know what to do. Very open-minded. That's amazing. I love it. I love it, I'll though. be the welcoming committee. That's <laughs> <laughs> and that's her. Start talking You're about You're welcome. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, next comment goes off of YouTube from one Nick Cullen. I'm of the opinion, not sure how popular, that we won't see much in the way of orbital space hotels. Once SpaceX gets the big Falcon rocket flying, the ap applications it can cover also include cruise ship-like flights. Hardware that has to go up and stay for repeated use has a lot of drawbacks compared to something you send up for a couple of weeks at a time and bring it back down for inspections and refurbishment. Um, I mean, I... Mm. Yeah, I guess, right? And that's that's the whole idea. That's that's sort of uh, if Ben Credible was here and or listening, and we won't know if either are happening <laughs> until he disagrees with me in the chat room. Um, <laughs> that's that was the whole concept. I think it even actually came up a little bit earlier in the chat room of like, look, that's why uh, we are so sort of like down on the space shuttles. Like it was supposed to be com just refurbishable, really quick, go back up. It was right. supposed to fly multiple times a week or at least once a week, kind of thing. All these different things going on, and that's like totally just not what happened um, but if you can get to that sort of point where you do have a vehicle that's 
as easily, much like an airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you do the inspections, you do any sort of refurbishment, a little bit of, you know, paint over here, whatever, and then send mm -hmm. it on its way again, then yeah, you can totally go for like cruise ship like flights, uh, quote unquote here. Mm -hmm. um, Thoughts yeah, I mean, I think that them saying <laughs> that, like, um, I'm of the opinion, not sure how popular, that we won't see much in the way of orbital space hotels. So, obviously, like, that's, to me, like, I feel the same exact way, where it's just like, well, there isn't really a lot that's holding us back from actually doing that mm -hmm. because of the accessibility in which we have now with rockets. Mm -hmm. And we will be having soon and, like, very, very soon. Totally. So, I understand, you know, obviously the, the drawbacks and the problems um, and exactly what you mentioned with uh, the space shuttle program. But I think that... Um, you know, the fact that we had already gone through that and now this is a new era that we've entered, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of like just growing on it and we're constantly building up the blocks. So I think that, you know, I mean, I think it's great and I think regardless, it's not, it's gonna have multiple applications. It's not just gonna be um, for one thing, like, re, you know, right now we have recargo missions to the ISS and, right. you know, there's gonna be so many other things that like the BFR will be able to do. Um, and then other, obviously other um, rockets that other space companies are gonna be having, obviously mm -hmm. Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic. And I think that there's gonna just be so much more um, that, that there's potential for. So, um, yeah, I mean, your, your opinion's popular to me, Nick, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm in the same boat, I think that, um, yeah, we won't see much in the space way. hotels. Yay! Nay. I, I I think both. Why not have both? You can all yeah. you know, have a there big Falcon space station. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yes. I was like, oh, come on, we got the ISS <laughs> up there. Yes. We could rendezvous yeah. at some point, like meet exactly. an astronaut, have dinner with an astronaut right. for an extra million dollars. But yeah, actually, like, like, right. have the like you know the it's honeymoon, space credits, honeymoon it's fine. suite. You know, yes. looking out that way. Space casino. Right? Right. Because it's probably going to be unregulated up there, if you know mm. what I'm saying. Dark oh, Caesar's Palace. Maritime law would extend up. <laughs> <laughs> really? Right, just directly over the, <laughs> <laughs> just over the water. It, cool. it depends what you're, exactly, <laughs> what you're orbiting around. Like, well, now we're in That's Amazonian amazing. territory. <laughs> so I think uh, a little bit to uh, go against Nick here, I apologize. Uh, so you said, yeah, I would go. I would go on the first yes. one. Not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, Jade, you said you would go eventually. Unless uh, she was Kirk in it. Right, unless she gets to be was. Kirk. Uh, <laughs> you know, you I haven't ever asked you, would you go? I would definitely go. I would not want to be the first um, of just like essentially any mission. Um, same thing with Mars. <laughs> uh, same thing with also uh, suborbital. I would want there to be at least a handful of guinea guinea pigs, it's kind of wrong for me to say. But, sure. <laughs> test uh, pilots. Yeah, test <laughs> pilots. Like Plus, I also, I, I really see myself when I'm much older actually doing long journeys yeah. to space. Like, I, I when I'm much like older, have age. a family, have, yeah. No. <laughs> She's like, yeah, yeah, wait, wait, wait. Totally oh, totally totally no, like 80, you know? And right. like, I know maybe like, I honestly think that with, with medicine and technology by that age, I don't think it'll be too much of a concern of the age, to be honest. Right. Uh, where now you have someone who's 80 and a lot of people are still extremely fragile and I I think with honestly with um, just injections uh, different things that uh, older elderly people have right. I think by the time I'm 80 I don't think it would be that that many obstacles to go to space and if there is I would risk it see it I, I don't think I would go I don't think I would go out for an extended period of time really? but like a space hotel yeah, yeah. like I, I'm also very B.A. Baracus. Like, you need to knock me out in order to get there, and then I'm wow. probably okay. Lots of bad drill. It's an A-team reference, yeah. really old time. Uh, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think I would be really good. I get crap. I'm crap on planes. Like, I'm not really fantastic. Like, I'm okay, and I'm better, but I think the first, like, space launch I do, I would just... I. What uh, about like it would be awful. having like you know a service tension tension champagne like little like champagne bubbles? And that just, sounds like, great. Drink that. I'm there. That'd be great. It's, it's, it's going from here to there. That's my problem. I, I guess and I'll so be I think and so I think out, the right. idea being like okay, I can be in a hotel and I can like I can see this. That's cool. That's where I live. I can see that. That's cool. I'm sure, uh, my friends live there. Like I'm I'm good there in that weird it's, it's sort of journey. middle space. It's the journey part. I think is terrible. Uh, uh, I, I, that scares so the absolute you, so, so you don't like medicine. the Guardians of the Galaxy. Galaxy ride then. Um, I, you know, I like it now, but I really like it. that's a different that's a different conversation. Uh, but yeah, so it's so for me, the space hotels seem like a perfect middle ground right. in mm -hmm. a weird way. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I don't know if it's popular or not popular in, in that particular sense, but I think uh, for somebody who's not really great with heights. <clears throat> Yes. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think that's a really great idea, personally. And so it's space bike funny. volunteers, right? <laughs> yes, of course, I would volunteer, volunteer for a long-term trip. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think you also hit on something. I, 
I think long term life up there, I mean, looking at um, Scott Kelly's telomeres, right? Mm. They grew quite a bit while they mm -hmm. were up there. Older people might, well, we might have geriatric stations <laughs> to prolong life. And, yeah. uh, you know, I'm going to go to the the uh, documentary Contact, uh, where oh, <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Sorry. please sign right? it. Yep. <laughs> SR Haddon, right? What, you got all the money in the world, you put yourself in space. It's less damaging on your joints, your circulatory system doesn't have to sure. work as hard to fight gravity. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's some potential there as well. It wouldn't just I would be. Retire. We're going to go out. Retirement homes in space. Space is in New Florida. Yeah, yeah. it's funny. Now that you say that, that's what I was thinking. But then yeah, Tommy like Bahamas and, and, and the coconut drinks, and even Johnny Spacer says space hospice or hospice. Hospice. Oh, oh. nailed it. Wow. Well, We're hospice, going into business uh, right volunteers. now. Yeah. You heard it here first. We'll yes. take a starting bids at one billion dollars. That's one so billion good. dollars. Yes. <laughs> one. That's not enough. About fifty so billion. Good. <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right, so next question comes off of YouTube from The Moon is Square, which we could probably even just stop there and discuss yep. that for a while. But, uh, <laughs> Go on. So well, there's on. an actual question. So, <laughs> Dr. Robert Brown uh, said, Curiosity Sky Crane landed, quote unquote, with 400 kilograms of extra fuel, which have any plans been made to not waste so much mass by sending less fuel this time? I understand needing extra safety margin but at first, but next time, that is half the actual payload weight lost. Just imagine the benefits of 400 kilograms of extra instrumentation or robustness on the rover. Huh. I mean, I, obviously that question was a little bit more geared towards Kim. Uh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah. That one, I mean, that's actually news to me. Um, one, one of the stories that I've heard about the Sky Crane is that it was on fumes. So this, I, hmm. and I, I looked, I, when I read this, I looked him up and he was there on the project. So, so I'm going to take his, he would know? Yeah. Got it. So I'm going to take his word. But one of, what I heard is that if Curiosity had not signaled touchdown, Basically, right when it did, mm -hmm. uh, the Sky Crane wouldn't have had enough propulsion left to keep itself above Curiosity mm. and then take off. It would have kind of slowly, kind of collapsed onto the rover. Ooh, ouch! So, oh. uh, and another thing that happened with Curiosity is the um, the the parachute. It was at breaking point. They were so lucky that it. So it, that it didn't tear itself apart. And when that parachute shreds, if you've seen any of the test videos that JPL has released, um, when those supersonic parachutes shred, they shred. Mm. Um, it's nothing. Your rover just becomes a meteorite. <laughs> um, so this is, even if it did have 400 kilograms of extra fuel, I'm on board with that. Because if anything goes wrong, if it has to pick a new location, if the, the landing site is right. a little off kilter, if it's for some reason just beyond curiosity, I mean Mars 2020's tipping point, I want them to be able to redirect the rover. For sure. And if you don't have enough fuel, all of the money that you've spent on your mission, yeah, that's just, just becomes a scrap pile on Mars. Yeah. Uh, Zweeby in the, in the chat room says, if you add 400 kilograms of extra instrumentation, you will have to carry more fuel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a really yes. decent point. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, like, yeah, exactly as Sarah's saying. I think having that little bit of, that's what we call nominal. Yes. <laughs> right? Not a bit of real on that one. Nominal. Right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, great. Okay, uh, so we answered that one. Uh, yeah. The next comment comes off of YouTube from Old Gamer Noob. It says, speaking of the new space station trend, was Gateway Spaceport mentioned? I'm too lazy to rewind and go check myself. <laughs> uh, Love the honesty. <laughs> right, that's uh, that's kind of funny. Um, if I remember correctly, we are actually having the Gateway Space. I was going to say the Gateway Spaceport, but Gateway is actually coming on the show. Uh, in a couple of weeks, if uh, it's actually not here in the in the rundown, so I can't answer that for you. Somebody is going to put that into the chat room for me so that I can read it to you live. But I believe that uh, Gateway is actually coming onto the show yes. shortly. Yes. Stay tuned for details of that, uh, so John. that we can answer all of those questions and more. So now, before we get into uh, what we are doing the very next week, I want to make sure I also still thank our ground support citizens. Uh, these are the people who contribute one dollar per episode, up to two dollars and fifty cents, and every little bit 
it helps, as we were saying, if you would like to continue making these awesome shows, because it really, it would, we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you. We would be having these great conversations in uh, coffee shops, as uh, Space Mike said earlier. You can always feel free to become part of the Citizens of Tomorrow. You can head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. And speaking of next week, the incredible Jeff <laughs> from Fueled by Death Cast, which is the Death <laughs> Wish Coffee yes. uh, podcast that is going on the International Space Station, is going to be on our show. And guess who's going to be interviewing the incredible Jeff, Fueled by Death Cast, talking about Death Wish Coffee, going on the International Space Station. Who's doing what? You, no, you, you. Uh, no, I, I am. Oh. I am because oh, it's coffee. Because it's coffee and it's space. And, and coffee runs coffee in her veins. So, uh, yeah, so talk. I would. Coffee talk. We're going to do some we're coffee gonna talk. Some space coffee. You're going to be like an espresso maker. I totally <laughs> should. Space clothes, space, I, space and coffee. Yes, I totally should. Uh, oh, good. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Jade Kim. Uh, John Bill, Bill, <laughs> Bill Kell, is that how you say that? From Gateway Foundation will be joining us on Orbit 11.27 on July 7th. But for the one in between, 11.26, I will be interviewing uh, the incredible Jeff. So uh, that's pretty much all Amazing. we've got for this particular episode. Thank you, ladies. It has been a pure <laughs> thank you. joy. And, thank you, guys. Uh, we will see you guys all next week. Bye. 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 Bye.